Hello and welcome. I'm Katrina Walker and I'm a FAF educator. I'm super thrilled today to show you a technique called piecing in the hoop. Now I know a lot of you, if you do quilting, you're aware that of course you can incorporate embroidery into your quilts, but piecing, do you know you could do piecing in the hoop? Well, if you didn't, I'm excited to share with you. And, oh, we see have people from all over. We have people from San Antonio, um, was just there not that long ago. What a great town that is. So excited to, to welcome all of you to my studio. So piecing in the hoop. This is something that's a lot of fun. And I'm super glad that my FAF is, you know, perfection begins, starts here. That's our, our motto, right? Well, it's a good thing that my machine is perfection because I am not. And if you aren't perfect, then you're in good company because these machines make it so easy. And I think that's what you'll really love about piecing in the hoop is that it makes perfect piecing possible. All right, for those of us who are less than perfect. So this is actually a technique and an embroidery design that, um, or set of embroidery designs that I'm going to use or I have used for a little project that's going to be in my Sonet studio. So this is just a little, a little uh, wall hanging project that incorporates this piecing in the hoop technique that I'm going to teach you and um, just some real fun batiks, just, just in time for spring, you know, I think we're all ready, ready for a little spring weather, right? So, okay, so how this works is, of course, it all begins with an embroidery design. So if we look at my machine, so here on the screen, we have this embroidery design. Now, you see there's a lot of lines on here. There's, there's all different stitches. And this is one of many designs in my Sonet library that can be used for this technique. And they come in a whole range of sizes, clear from 200 by 200 um, down to, I have a little sample here. And this is actually made for the 120 by 120 hoop. So this would be perfect if you wanted to make, say, a set of pieced coasters. And this is just a great way to use up scraps and a whole lot of fun, a whole lot of fun to do. So how this works is it's much like if you've ever done paper piecing, it's kind of like paper piecing, only it's a lot easier because, you know, of course, your FAF Creative Icon 2 is going to do all of the work. So we use a we use a diagram, so each design has its own little diagram, and much like paper piecing, we have numbers here that tell us what order we're going to stitch. So I know there's a lot of, a lot of printing here, but this is block one, or, or piece one, then we go on to piece number two, three, four, five. This is a basic log cabin block, that's why I'm, Choosing to use it, it's something that's very familiar and it's it's very easy to stitch, but we just work our way around in a clockwise direction. So each of these designs has a PDF with the diagrams for each design that gives you an indication of how to stitch it out. So so don't worry if you you know look at your, your screen and you see all these stitches. This is where I like to go into my Sonet software. And I like to go ahead and use my design player. Um, sometimes if I have a design, I'm not sure how it goes together. I use design player to go ahead and play this so I can see exactly how each layer of stitching goes in. And then it looks a lot less confusing because when you look at it on the screen, there's a lot going on, but it's, it's really just a fun, fun project. Okay, so let's get started, right? And again, this is a great way to use scraps. So I've gone ahead and I've stitched out the first thing that your FAF Creative Icon 2 will do is it's going to stitch out um, the outline of the blocks. So again, this is the same as when we look at this diagram and we have all our block placements. So the sewing machine, our Creative Icon 2, is going to go ahead and stitch out the outline first. That's not terribly exciting to watch. So I went ahead and did that step for us. So it's waiting patiently 
for me to place the first piece of fabric, which is going to go here into this central square. Now I like to use a very non-traditional tool here. I like to use a little glue stick when I'm doing this to help hold my, my fabric in place. And I just keep it within the lines. And I'm going to place my first piece of fabric. And something that you're going to notice is that it doesn't have to be perfect. Again, this is, the machine makes it easy. You know, our Icon 2 will do all, the, all of the heavy lifting for us. So don't worry about your scraps being cut perfectly to shape. It won't matter. So let's go ahead and we're going to stitch that fabric in place. All right, so now our Faf Creative Icon 2 has stopped. This is built into the design and it's ready for us to place our next piece of fabric. Now, these lines that were initially stitched down, these are basically our fabric placement lines. Fabric placement lines. And hello to everyone. I, I sure enjoy seeing where you're all coming from. That's wonderful. Everywhere, all over the country. So these fabric placement lines gives an indication of where to set our next piece of fabric. So I'm not lining up with this stitching that's holding my block in place. I'm actually going to line up basically with this here. Now I could go ahead and trim my fabric, but I don't have to if I don't want to. And actually I usually use my finger and I can feel the placement for the stitching. All right, so I can just set it there and then my Faf Creative Icon is going to stitch it in place. Now I know it's lined up and I know it's gonna stitch straight across there. So I'm just doing a little wiggle here. There we go. So my Faf Creative Icon 2 has stopped again. And I'm just going to, it's, cut the thread so it's I'm going to let that move out of my way. So now it's stitched this in place and I'm just going to go ahead and finger press it into position. Now, again, I like to go ahead and use a little glue stick to help my fabric stay in place. And sometimes what I'll do is I will loosen my hoop just so that I can slide it just far enough forward to hold things a little bit nicer. And not, you don't have to smear a ton of it on there, just a little bit. So I've just slid my hoop forward just a tiny bit so I can place my fabric more easily. And then of course you need to remember to slide it back into place. So my Faf Creative Icon 2 has gone ahead and gone into position to do my next piecing. And so when I look at my diagram, I can see that now I'm going to stitch piece number three. And yes, Patricia, I'm glad you could join us. And that's the wonderful thing is this is always recorded. And so you have the ability to go ahead and watch it and catch up later too. So all good. So we're doing a piecing in the hoop. And so we're about to stitch piece number three. So I go to my machine and again, for some of you, this may drive you a little crazy, having all the extra fabric there. I will tell you for your design, it doesn't matter, but it does, I can feel it under my fabric and it does help me to place, place each piece as we go. But that's the beauty of this is that it's going to be perfect piecing no matter what I do, which is always comforting, so. You know, sometimes you're sewing at the odd hours of the morning and it's nice to know that, <laughs> that your, your sewing machine will take care of things for you. So now that this is placed on the line or near it, as long as it catches it, my scrap is big enough that I don't really have to worry too much about whether it's gonna be large enough. I just have to make sure that after it's stitched down, when I flip it over, that it will cover up this area here which I know it is. So it's better to err on the side of a larger scrap than a smaller scrap when you're doing this technique. So let's go ahead and stitch that down.
So again, it's gone ahead and stitched our fabric in place and then lined up for the next piecing. I'm gonna go ahead and again, slide this forward a little bit so you can see a little bit better what I'm doing. Plus it gives me a chance to do a little basting here. Of course, the important thing is to remember to put your hoop back in place and be real gentle. You don't want to knock things out of alignment, but just pull it forward and then I'm going to finger press my next piece into place. Oh, Connie, how nice to see you, neighbor. I'm actually based in Spokane, Washington, so Seven Mile is very close by. I actually am situated near Riverside State Park. So I'm waving in your general direction. So there's our next piece of fabric into place. And actually the, the sewing machine, um, the Creative Icon 2 is actually cutting the thread automatically. So I am not, the question was asked, sorry. The question was asked um, what I was using to cut my top thread. And my FOF Creative Icon has automatic thread cutters. So when it gets to the stop design, it automatically cuts my threads and um, goes ahead and goes into position. Oh, and Diane's from Shadle, another person right across the river from me. That's really funny. Hello, hello, all you Spokaneites. We're well represented today. All right, so it's, I have my hoop placed back in position. We're ready to stitch piece number four. So again, for those of you who might be, be uh, coming in sooner, we're working off a diagram. So this is piecing in the hoop, and it's something that um, my Foff Creative Icon is makes absolutely flawless for me, which is great because I am, um, I tend to do more garment sewing. And so when I do piecing, I appreciate having the extra help of a machine that sews beautifully. So we've done one, two, three, we're about to do number four on the diagram for this particular, it's, it's kind of a little bit like paper piecing. If you've ever done paper piecing, it's a little bit like that. So let's go back to your machine. Let me go ahead and set the next piece of fabric into place. And so when you're choosing your scraps, you just wanna make sure that when it stitches these areas, so when it stitches these areas, you just need to make sure that your scrap after the seam is stitched is going to cover up each area in case you've never done paper piecing. So when I place this, now there is actually a line of stitching under here and that gives me a better idea where to place the edge of my fabric. And again, you can go ahead and trim that off for some of you, this might drive you nuts to just have pieces of fabric sticking out. So you can always choose to come in here and, and trim as you go. Um, I don't usually bother because it's not necessary, but I just wanted to show you that it can be done. So I'm just gonna go ahead and line up my fabric. But again, if you use a large enough scrap, you don't have to be precise at all. So. And Virginia says that she loves to use her machine to piece. Absolutely. If this is so easy, I almost feel guilty. Almost. <laughs> almost. So there my Foff Creative Icon has cut the thread and I'm ready to go ahead and baste piece number four into place. So again, I just like a little glue stick to keep everything taut. No, that's not an official uh, official tool for this. Uh, it's just a personal preference of mine. So there's piece number four. So we're coming along. See, we have one, two, three, four of our diagram. All right, it's lined up to do piece number five. So let me go ahead and grab that. Just checking my alignment there. My pieces are large enough that I do not have to be precise. Alrighty, here we go. Piece number five has been tacked down. So it's ready to go into place. 
We just round and round we go. There we go. All righty. We are halfway done already. Actually more than halfway done. There's only nine pieces. Okay. So while my icon is patiently waiting, I'm gonna grab another piece, fabric. And we're gonna place that. I'm gonna curl back my fabric a little bit, just double check my placement. Okay, let's go. All righty, we are moving now. Finger press that into place. Oops, got a little goober there. Clean that up. See how easy this is? And of course my stitching is just perfect. Oh, Lois asked, you know, excellent question, Lois. Thank you so much. She was asking what stabilizer I'm using and shame on me, I didn't even mention that. So thank you for asking. I'm using just a single layer of um, the lightweight, lightweight cutaway. So this is a, a FOF stabilizer. It's, um, and of course the name of it just went right out of my head, but it's our lightweight, um, lightweight cutaway um, stabilizer. And so it's really nice. You can see how sheer it is. I love it because it gives a lot of stability without adding bulk. And if I have heavier, this is, I'm just doing running stitches, lightweight stitches on this. So I don't need a heavy, heavy stabilizer. Now I could even be stitching this on top of a layer of batting if I wanted to. Um, I'm not choosing to do that for my project, but I could. But I like this lightweight stabilizer very much. And if I'm stitching a heavier embroidery design, I will often use a couple layers of it if I need more support. And then I can even grade them. And they never show up in my project. Now, nothing looks, oh, I just hate it when there's a, a logo or something that's been embroidered and there's this heavy circle around it, right, where the stabilizer is. Oh, I just hate that. So this is really great stuff because it never, ever, leaves a mark like that. So it's my favorite. I use it for all kinds of things. So here we go with the next piece. Just gonna double check my placement here. That looks good. I don't actually have to fuss too much because as long as my piece of fabric is big enough, I know that I'm in good shape. Okay, so let's go ahead and finger press that. Also, let's do a little basting. I like to baste. Technically, you can just finger press it, but I like things to stay put. I'm kind of fussy that way. All right, we're on the home stretch now. We are on piece number eight. And as you can see, I'm just being so lazy. I'm not even bothering to trim off the extra. I certainly could, but just in the interest of time, I'm choosing not to. Just feeling my, with my fingers where that line is. Okay. Make sure I locked my hoop back into place. <laughs> you can guess how I, you can guess how I know I need to check that my hoop is back in place. <laughs> Cause I've certainly made that mistake. All right, piece eight is in place. I'm gonna go ahead and stick that down. Now I can, again, I do choose sometimes to go in here and trim off some of this extra fabric. 
And you can do that anytime. I love these little snips. These are my absolute favorite snips with the little curved tips. They are so sharp. Love them. And I don't have to worry about this little piece here. It doesn't matter. Question was asked, um, does the glue from the glue pen go through the stabilizer onto the machine bed? Um, this does not. Now, um, I am using a pretty common type of glue stick. Um, and I've never had trouble with it ever, ever gumming my needle or anything. So no, I have not had trouble with it sticking, um, going through the stabilizer onto my bed. But I'm also, you know, you just need a little smear. And by the way, if you keep your glue sticks, um, in the refrigerator, they'll stay firmer, and then you get a, a thinner layer of glue stick. So there's there's a little tip for you on your glue stick management. Another question too from Vivian. She said, where did you get the piece in the hoop design? My sonnet, what is it called? Thank you so much for asking, Vivian. Yes, this comes from my sonnet. And just for those of you who might be um, coming in. Now this design happens to be number 130-05. If you look in the quilting category, I think it's either quilting or piecing and my Sonet library, there's several different variations of the um, piecing in the hoop design. This one is um, actually about 150 by 150. So it's kind of a, a medium sized design. There are others that are 200 by 200. And there's even like this little one, it's not that one, this one, that is a 120 by 120 design. So there's there's several different designs that are available. And, um, and anyhow, it's a lot like paper piecing, as you can see. And each design comes with instructions for how to do it and this diagram that tells you what order it's stitched in. So thank you for asking. And oh, good, thank you so much. My 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 friends at FAF have posted up a link there. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, so you can click on that link. Also, a um, question was asked by Connie, whether the curve snips are available at the FAF dealer. That's right, I forgot, these are FAF branded. And um, they're actually part of a beautiful sewing, special sewing uh, set that you can you can purchase. And um, and they are just fantastic. Love these. So they, I believe they are available from the dealership. Um, and that might be a question actually for, for Ryan or Amy to answer um, if you can buy them separately. But I know they're part of, I know that they're part of a beautiful sewing set because I did, did purchase that and I love it. it. Comes with the snips. There's a beautiful pair of Foff scissors in there, uh, all kinds of things. It's just beautiful. Okay, so another question, um, is it okay to use the metal hoop? Yes, absolutely you can use the metal hoop. I'm choos choosing to use the 200 by 200 quilters hoop uh, simply because I like, I feel it is very secure, but I'll talk about the metal hoop in just a bit. All right, so we're on our last piece, our last piece. So we're gonna go ahead and place that down. And I'm actually going to move my hoop forward so you can see better what I'm doing. And I am gonna go ahead and clean up my edges just a little bit. So underneath here, whoops, helps if you can see it. So underneath here, I do have basically fabric placement lines that gives me an idea where I can trim off some of the excess. It isn't necessary for me to do this, but it does make it easier for me to see sometimes where I'm going, so. I'll just leave that little tab off. But the good news is you don't have to. You can leave it just the way it is. I just want to make sure that my fabric is lined up. Press place it back onto the machine gently but firmly. And I can actually move this over just a little bit more. You can actually feel those stitching lines with your finger which can be really helpful. And for this last round that I've been stitching, I actually do like to leave it a little bit large. See how this is sticking out past my border quite a bit? And you'll see why, because 
I like to leave it large because I want to have a quarter inch seam allowance extending past my stitching line when all is said and done. So let's go ahead and stitch our very last piece into place. Okay, make sure my hoop is in position. Fantastic, let's go. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Ryan and Amy. They've posted up that yes, you can purchase the scissors individually from your FOF dealer. Okay, well, I thought you might, but I uh, wasn't 100% sure, so I wanted to get the official answer. So thank you so much, my friends at FOF, keeping me, keeping me uh, factual here. So that's our last piece of fabric. Woohoo! All of our piecing is done. I'm going to show you on another camera. Let me just take this off. I have more stitching to do, but I want to show you what it looks like so far. So here is our piecing in the hoop. So I'm not perfect, but so far my piecing is. Isn't that fun? Okay, but there's more stitching to do. So we're going to place it back on the machine. Because next, my Foff Creative Icon 2 is going to go ahead and it's going to stitch basically the boundary of the block into place. All right. Fabulous. So Maggie's asking, would the machine stitch if you forget to put it back on the machine or would you get an error message? That's an excellent question, Maggie. And what happens is if, if the hoop wasn't on the machine at all, you would get an error message, it would pick it up. But if you have it, if you've just slid it forward a little bit and it's not locked into place, it can still feel that the hoop is there but <laughs> you won't be in the correct position. So this is why I just, as a, an expert tip, just reminding you that if you, if you go ahead and loosen it so that you can arrange the fabric or give it a trim, just remember to always check that you're locked back into place. So having been there, done that, <laughs> I like to, to pass along um, some tips for avoiding mistakes. All righty. So now the machine has gone ahead and we have tacked in the place. So we have our border stitched around the block. And so now it's asking me actually to change my thread color because this particular block has fun, crazy quilt stitching on it. So um, I can show you on this block. So here is my little project with some of the completed blocks and you can see this crazy quilt stitching. And so that's actually what we're going to be doing next. I'm going to just grab my, my decorative thread and we're going to go ahead and re-thread the machine and stitch out some beautiful crazy quilt stitches. So that's one reason I, I chose this particular block because I happen to be kind of fond of crazy quilt stitches and I love that look. Now this is just a basic um, log cabin design, but this particular collection, there are three different blocks um, that are this size. So there's actually nine blocks total in three different sizes. So this is the largest block and there's two other sizes. And um, this is nice because it allows uh, those, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm stitching on a FOF Creative Icon. So my Creative Icon 2 can stitch up to 260 by 260. So I can do very large blocks with this machine. But I recognize that you know, some of you have FOFs with smaller stitching areas. And so it's really nice for you to be able to, to stitch as well. So it's a very inclusive block design. So of course I'm gonna go ahead and let my FOF Creative Icon 2 
thread my needle for me, which this never gets old. <laughs> I tell you, having a sewing machine that will thread its own needle is just, uh, it's the best thing since sliced bread. So let's go ahead and stitch out some fun, crazy quilt style stitches for our block design. So I'm actually using, I'm using a, a semi-metallic thread called polystar. And it's actually a, a sulky thread. And the polystar, um, it's nice because it doesn't, it, it's not quite as abrasive as your standard metallic thread. So it's kind of a nice compromise between a metallic and a regular. In case you're wondering what I was stitching to, it's called polystar. And just gives it a little bit of sparkle. I just can't resist a little bit of sparkle. If we are able to create our own robot design using our mind and our software, and I'm happy to say we have a process of that, we have a lot of software and I'm happy to do the education of the process of the good and provider for the thanks to actually um surprising the online networks. Oops. Looks like my polystar decided to not cooperate for a moment. Oh, I see what happened. Actually, I didn't have it through the thread guide properly. So, sorry, Icon2, that was my mistake. Let's get you hooked back up. So see, in case you're wondering whether, whether the professionals have the same kinds of issues, we do. But of course, the beautiful thing is that when my machine, when the Icon2 gets unthreaded, it will thread itself. <laughs> so I never get tired of that. Okay, we're re-threaded. Let me just back up a couple st stitches. Now I'm, this takes about nine minutes to stitch out the stitches for this one. Oh, actually, thread was so tight, I broke a needle. So let's take that out. No wonder it didn't thread itself because there's no needle eye. Thankfully, I have embroidery needles standing by these things happen. And one thing, when you're stitching with a metallic thread or a synthetic thread, something you may not be aware of is that one thing that can happen is if you're doing a lot of stitching, especially if you're stitching very quickly, you can actually melt the thread. These needles get hot. And one of the reasons that we use, for instance, this is a chrome needle. Um, chrome is a type of coating that can, you can put on your needle and that chrome helps to dissipate heat. Okay, so if you have ever wondered why you can be stitching along and everything's fine, and then all of a sudden you have problems, it can be because your needle got hot, was hot, and it can actually melt your thread. So it's, it's really interesting what can happen. But meanwhile, we're back in business. New needle, threads threaded correctly. But Mindy was asking about, she was asking about two pair of designs. And so we should be running sixty lines. We want to have ideally place the lines of our own size that we want to work with the pattern. And then of course you're going to have sixty lines yes. You can think about that three things in the Now some of these folks in the block, folks in the box, some of these projects. Um, actually, uh, so that most of you 
asked about my tension, if I need to decrease my tension. Actually, I'm not seeing bobbin thread come up. I should put my, my readers on so I can look closer. Oh, interesting. Yeah, my apologies. It sounds like it might be possible that my my microphone um, it may be using a different microphone than what the than the microphone I thought it was using. So, um, and Sharon, um, the question was asked. Um, she was asking, how do you find the video after the tutorial is finished? Um, they're actually going to be posting up uh, the recording. Yeah, thank you so much for letting me know um, about the microphone. So um, anyway, the, the recording will be, um, will be posted up on um, the website. So yes. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Connie, oh, Connie's saying she has a jacket she needs to embellish. And yes, this would be really fun and super easy to do, to just go ahead and put this right on there. Super easy. So anyhow, so we have another about five minutes of decorative stitching to go, but I'm just going to cheat and pretend that we've done this. Let me just go ahead and cut my threads. Because of course, you know, we have the wonderful magic of uh, TV going on here. So here we have a block that's already finished. And so what I like to do is to go ahead and I trim, actually let me lower my, this out of the way so it's not. So here is a finished block with our log cabin design. Now you can see with this one, this one didn't didn't pass my test because I didn't use high enough contrast for my center block. And so you have to think about, you know, your color choices, of course, when you're doing this. And so this was kind of low, low um, contrast here. So this is why I didn't pass the test. But you see here, so you're piecing and see, look how perfect that is. I didn't have to really pay attention. I just go through all the steps and there's all your decoration. But again, what I like to do is I like to take my ruler and once this is stitched out, because when you're stitched out, the machine is going to go ahead and leave. It's going to stitch the perimeter of your block and see why I leave extra wide edges on this. And that's so that I can then trim it and I take my ruler my quilting rulers. So I'll take my ruler and I'll set my ruler at just like a scant quarter of an inch. And if I cut at just a scant quarter of an inch using that stitching line as a guide, then when I sew my quarter inch seams, it'll just miss that stitching line and I'll maintain my block size. So again, just set your ruler up for like a scant quarter inch. This ruler and my cutting mat are part of a, a quilting set for Foff, which is really a nice set. Um, and this, this cutting mat actually rotates too, which is really fun because, you know, sometimes it's nice to just stay put and rotate your blocks as you're cutting them. I can show you that. But anyway, so 
leave yourself some nice edges around your block so that when you trim it, you can trim it up like this. And then again, you can go ahead and just set your ruler for a scant quarter of an inch, cut, you know, cut each side, and you can rotate this around, you know, and do, do each side. So I love that someone finally figured out the whole rotating cutting mat idea. That's huge. Um, so anyhow, so just leave that intact. So there's your block. Now for my little project, again, this is kind of a sneak preview because I'll be putting this up in the, my Sonet Studio coming up. So there's here's some of the other designs. I'm just gonna stand up so you can see. So here's some of the other designs. Now you saw me stitch our beautiful log cabin. So our log cabin here, but there's also kind of a wonky log cabin style. And let's see. Yeah, so there's two wonky log cabin styles and then a log cabin in this particular set of three blocks. And so for this project, I created four of the log cabin sizes or the plain log cabin designs, excuse me. And then I did two each of the wonkies for a set of eight and then just added some very basic sashing, very basic sashing and just did a real narrow, narrow little border on there narrow uh, binding because it's, it's such a, it's a slender design. It's just meant to be a wall hanging. So I, I didn't want to put wider binding on this particular one. And I chose, because this is a wall hanging, I chose not to use batting for it. Now I know that's not traditional, but I'm just kind of an untraditional kind of girl. So you don't have to put batting in absolutely everything. And I know the batting companies are not gonna be happy with me saying that, but um, I put batting in things I want insulated, not, not just everything. But just if you use, um, I'll show you in the close-up. But if you have, if you're already working with, you know, those, those beautiful decorative stitches for these blocks, then when you go to do your quilting, when you go to do your quilting, you know, consider using, we have so many beautiful crazy quilt type stitches built into our Foff Creative Icon 2. There's no reason not to use them. Now I was using one that just stitches pretty fast because of course I was in a hurry, but there's a lot of really beautiful ones like the ones that were used to actually um, embellish these blocks as part of the embroidery design. And so have fun with, you know, with your sashing and things, have fun with those, des those, those designs and then if you have any imperfections, you know, those crazy quilt designs can really help to hide any intersections that might not be absolutely perfect. Now, you know, maybe you are a perfect piecer. I am not. So I appreciate any help I can get in looking perfect. And of course, piecing in the hoop is basically perfect every single time, which is so much fun. So the question was asked earlier, could you use the metal hoop? Absolutely. We have a fantastic new 200 by 200 metal hoop, and this is a really great hoop to use. Now, I tend to use this more for when I'm doing quilting in the hoop. So you absolutely can use it for piecing. In fact, I think that there was, um, I believe there was an Instagram reel the other day showing the, hoop, the metal hoop being used for that purpose. But um, for me, I like to use it more for quilting in the hoop, and it's absolutely fantastic because it's easy to reposition. So very easy to take your quilt and all those quilt layers and to tack them down. These magnets are very strong. In fact, you know, be careful how you use them because they are super strong, but it will hold your whole quilt sandwich. And that just makes it easy. I mean, you maybe need to tweak it. You know, you do your positioning with your projector or precise positioning or however you like to do it. But you know, sometimes you wanna just tweak it just a tiny bit and it's easy to do with the magnets in the metal hoop. So yes, you absolutely can use your 200 by 200 metal hoop for doing any kind of piecing or quilting in the hoop. And now that we have a 200 by 200, it's nice that we have that larger size. All right, now another, um, if you're not aware, I did want to point out another tool. Now I chose to use just a real narrow like quarter inch 
when it was all finished, binding on this because I wasn't using batting. Okay, when you're when you're not using batting, you can get away with a really thin, thin border of whatever technique you want to finish your wall hanging um, like mine. But there is a new 5 8 inch quilt binder. And so when you're doing a traditional quilt, a lot of us like to use that slightly wider 5 8 inch. And you're thinking, well, why not just half inch? Well, it's because remember that with uh, a quilt sandwich, you have that thickness to deal with. And so that little bit of extra, that extra eighth of an inch really helps to make a nicer, more um, consistent, more of a true half inch binding. So it's really nice and it's meant to do a um, double folded binding with a five eight. So just, that's a whole lesson in itself. And I'll leave that to one of my colleagues to do, but just in case you weren't aware that's out, that's the FOF dealers have them. And another tool that I'm waiting for, it's, I haven't been able to pick it up yet, but we also have a magnifying glass. So, you know, if you find yourself like me constantly looking for your specs to see what's going on, we actually now have a magnifying glass with three different magnifications that you can snap onto your machine. So there's some really exciting new tools that have just been launched for FOF. So, so definitely look out for those. Okay. So, all right, so my, my friends at FOF have said that the recording for this today will be available as soon as we've ended. So, so Sharon, you can get caught up immediately. So that's fantastic. So are there any questions for me? Again, it's been lovely to host you. I'm FOF educator Katrina Walker, and I'm based here in Spokane, Washington, as are at least a couple of our viewers today, which that was a pleasant surprise. But we have people from Alaska, from Texas, from Utah, from Illinois. We have people from all over watching today. So it's it's really lovely to see see you all, <laughs> even though it's it's virtual. So are there any other questions? The question was, what happens if you try to resize this? What an excellent question, Heidi. Obviously, Heidi is a um, is a software aficionado like I am. And I'll just tell you that I haven't tried yet. I mean, one thing that would, would be affected, I mean, obviously you wanna make sure to use your resize, not just your scale. So scale means it just makes everything bigger, but it doesn't change the stitch density, but it changes the stitch density potentially, but use resize to make sure that your stitches recalculate properly. Um, yeah, I haven't tried it yet. Because like I said, I didn't, I actually thought about it, but then I decided not to because I didn't want to change the scale. You know, I didn't want to resize and make the decorative stitches larger. So that was that was what kind of held me back from going ahead and playing around with these and resizing them. So I just decided that that I was fine with the size they were. And I was going for just a small project anyway, like a wall hanging or a table runner. And so this the smaller size squares worked for me. But Heidi, um, go ahead and give it a try. You should be able to do that. Um, but again, it will make the decorative stitches, of course, resize larger as well. So you have to bear in mind, you know, maybe you like, maybe you want that to happen, maybe you don't. So, so bear that in mind. Oh, Josiane, yeah, you're very welcome. She said, thank you for the presentation. That's about all the French I understand. So, so thank you for using, using things that I can understand. But so see, we even have people all over the world, people from Tennessee, Canada, all over the place. Oh, that's so lovely. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know I enjoyed it and I hope you did too. And I really, really hope that you will go and check out those designs on my Sonet library because there's there's several different ones and they are so much fun to play with. And it's just a really great for technique for embellishing or heaven forbid, making a quilt. So thank you again. Oh, from the West Side of Washington too. All right, everyone, take care. Have a wonderful day and a great weekend.